All right, hello AP Physics 2 students. It is time for our second to last unit, and the last one is a smaller one. So we are excited that AP tests are approaching and that we're going to get to it soon. It's time for optics. Um, this unit includes waves and electromagnetic waves. I'm sure you love hearing the word electromagnetic again. Um, it includes lenses and mirrors and how waves travel and their behavior. And so there's a lot going on. So I'm going to jump into it so that we get rolling. I will refer to this unit as optics, but it is quite a bit more than that. And so we got to start by defining what waves are, because this has a lot to do with how uh, light travels and how these uh, optic interactions work. So first, a wave is a repeating disturbance or movement that transfers energy through matter or space. That's a really important definition. We want to make sure that we realize that energy is transferring. If you look real quick at what you're seeing here in this uh, little, uh, we're going to call it a GIF because that's what it is. Waves must have a medium to travel through. So we see a rope or something that designates an example like a rope here where a wave is being pushed down through it. Note that all those little dots move back to where they started once the wave has traveled through them, okay, it transfers energy through matter or space. It does not actually transfer material. Or if you've ever seen um, a pelican floating out in the ocean, when those waves roll by, they go up and down and they feel that change in energy and that energy movement that's actually going side to side, but they stay in the same spot. And that's important. And so that's what we're seeing here also. So some common examples are ocean waves, earthquakes, sound, and of course, we're going to get to eventually here, light waves. Some properties of the waves. We just got to define a couple of these things. We'll get a little bit of practice with this also. But first, the frequency of a wave. This is wave cycles in a given amount of time. Um, for our purpose and the size waves that we're going to be doing most of our work with, it's going to be cycles per second because they're going to be traveling very quickly. They're going to be electromagnetic waves, and they travel at the speed of light. So they're going to travel many, many times past, or many, many wave cycles will go by within a second. The next one is the period, and this is typically for slower traveling waves. So this is the time it takes one wave to complete a full cycle. So if we had big ocean waves rolling in, it might take three, four, five seconds for each wave to pass by. And so then we'd measure it more with the period as opposed to the frequency. But in reality, those two, if you think about the units of them, wave cycles per time or how long it takes for one full cycle, they're inverses of each other. So we'll talk a little bit about that later as well. The wavelength is literally the length of a wave. And it's important that we measure from the same locations. So wavelength, crest to crest, crest to crest here, trough to trough here. And again, all these other terms are things that we'll get to and, and talk about all, as well. But um, we see this little lambda symbol that refers to wavelength. And you can do it that way. Or we can measure this from this location right here on our rest position axis and go through one full crest upwards to another rest position and one full trough downwards back to where we started. And so this spot to that spot right there would be one full wavelength as well. So that's important to note also, it's really any location to the same location in the shape of the wave, wherever it repeats itself. That's one full wavelength. The amplitude, this is how high a wave displaces in the vertical direction. This wave would be traveling horizontally. So energy would be moving left to right or right to left. We don't really know because there's not a vector designation here. But what we do know is the amplitude is a movement in the uh, wave as it goes up and down or the material as the, as the energy transfers through it. And it is going to be in the opposite direction of where the wave is traveling. So if we are moving horizontally with our wave here, then our amplitude is going to be how high up and how high down the crest and the trough are. So you see the A's there for amplitude. Um, and that's really going to be more or less um, as in higher or lower based on the amount of energy that's traveling. So keep that in mind as well. Amplitude is a measure of the actual energy in a wave. Two types of waves we need to talk about quickly. First is transverse waves, and that's what we were just looking at. We saw the little movement there in the rope, just like we see right here. We see some kind of slinkier spring. We will look at these in class as well, so that's important to note. But any wave where we are giving a motion up and down to send energy left and right. So this causes the medium to vibrate at right angles to the direction in which the wave travels. That's important. The wave here is traveling right to left along this, but in order to make this wave, this hand has to go up and down, okay? Highest points to crest, lowest points to trough, and those particles are gonna vibrate perpendicular to the direction of motion, as in they are moving up and down 
as opposed to, or while the wave travels left to right. All right. Now, if the vibration and the direction of travel are the same, then we have something called a longitudinal wave. Right? These are also referred to often as compression or pressure waves, but longitudinal is the correct term, so we'll make sure that we're using that as much as possible here. This is a wave in which the vibration of the medium is parallel to the direction of travel. So this would be like an earthquake, typically, or, well, some types of earthquake waves. There are different types of earthquake waves. You remember that from earth science. But um, we've got a slinky here, let's say, and this person takes their hand and they push and pull real quick. So they move horizontally. Well, we see a wave then travel through the slinky down its path here where it compresses in some spots, a compression, and it spreads out in other spots. That's known as a rarefaction, okay? We'll look at some examples of this in class as well, but this would be a longitudinal wave. It's transferring energy. The material, the matter is still where it's all going to be um, or where it started at. So this slinky will go back to rest eventually, and all the little rings of the slinky will end up in the same spots that they started with. But the emotion and energy are both in the same direction, whereas for these transverse waves, again, they were perpendicular to each other. Now, how quickly these waves travel is something that's important as well. So, in, I mean, all, everything we've done with speed, we know our units are meters per second. Period was our measure for the amount of time for one cycle. And so if we have that and we're utilizing that, then we can say the wavelength in meters divided by the period in seconds there will give us the wave speed. Now a reminder, it's more often gonna be frequency and frequency is the inverse of period. So rather than saying one divided by the other, we can multiply wavelength and frequency to still get meters per second. This frequency is in Hertz. You've probably heard of things measured in Hertz for frequency before. It's a very common measurement in the real world and it is equivalent to one over a second. So it is the inverse of a second. OK, and the period would be in seconds, as mentioned. So two hertz equals 2.0 times one divided by seconds or two over a second. All right. So we'll do a little bit with wave speed. But again, most things that we're going to be dealing with are going to be light based. And so the speed is going to be C. It's going to be our speed of light. And that is on your reference table. Now, once we're past, now that we're past some of the basics for waves here, we need to go back to what happened with electromagnetic waves. You've seen this diagram in the past notes, and we know that when we've got one thing vibrating, another one's being made here, and our electromagnetic waves include an electric wave perpendicular to a magnetic wave, and you just tested on that, so we understand what that is, but I just wanted to bring this back quickly here so that we have um, a reminder real fast of what these can look like. And now we see that wave symbol being a little more um, understandable given what we've just talked about and gone through there. So these waves travel at the speed of light. That is um, assumed to be three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Nothing actually gets to three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. It all technically, because it all has some mass, is just below that. It's like 2.997 something, but whatever. Regardless, we're going to use that as our speed of light, and that should be what's on your equation sheet as well. And um, so the reminder here, right? I mean, when it encounters an object, its field exerts force on the object. And we've talked about all those types of things, and that's important. It transfers energy, that force can be applied, all that fun stuff from last unit that you have tested on, and hopefully you haven't quite forgotten yet, but we're gonna do a bunch of other stuff with that. Now, waves and particles. Electromagnetic waves are very, very unique. I'm gonna give a very brief intro to this, and this will be something we'll cover in our last unit. But we have little particles that make up electromagnetic waves known as photons. Another way to think of a photon is a free electron traveling very quickly, speed of light, okay? This energy depends on the frequency of the waves. Now, photons are said to have a dual nature. They're said to travel as both a particle and a wave. So when we've talked about particles, we've had something like this eraser here that travels like this right? It's got a velocity. Maybe it's stationary. We give it an acceleration so it speeds up and it's going faster and faster. And so it travels like a small particle. Well, photons are very small particles. And so they do that, but they're so small and they have tons of energy packed into them, despite being so small that they're vibrating as they do that. Okay. They're vibrating because they've got all this energy. So they are vibrating and traveling this way as a particle. So they're actually going like this as they go across there. And if I were to trace the path of this eraser as I just did that, 
you would see a little wave function going across the screen there, right? And so they travel, or they're said to have a dual nature and travel as both waves and particles. We will elaborate on that in our last unit after this one. But all of those photons, as they travel and make up electromagnetic waves, determine what is known as the electromagnetic spectrum. I'm going to run through the different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum pretty quickly here because most of these are pretty easy. But the way this is sorted is by frequency and wavelength. We see microwaves here towards the end where we have the longest waves. And then as the waves get shorter, we get all the way to the other side here from, well, I'm sorry, and we got radio and TV. Microwaves were on the top there, obviously, right? But radio waves, radio waves really being the longest wavelengths to gamma rays here with the shortest. And you see as those get shorter, knowing that they all travel with the same speed, they must then have a changing frequency that is related directly to the wavelength. So again, velocity equals wavelength times frequency. If the velocity is the same for all of these, then as the wavelength goes down, the frequency must go up. You see the frequency going up here on the bottom as you see the waves getting shorter. That's all that's happening. They're all traveling at the speed of light. They're all transferring energy. It's really just a matter of how the frequency and the wavelength change as they do this. All right, and we're gonna talk about what that is right now. The first one, very long. All right, longest wavelengths, longer than a millimeter. In some cases, kilometers long. Nope, not an exaggeration, okay? Some of these wavelengths are very, very long. They're used in communications, radar, actually in microwaves, all right? And quick little fun fact, the reason that there's all those dots on the microwave screen when you close it is because they are spaced out appropriately so that microwaves can escape, but you can still see in, but it sets up the wavelength properly so that all the microwaves are still stuck inside and bouncing around. They can't fit out between those little dot particles and they stay inside, but you can still see what's going on. You can watch your marshmallow expand and get huge when you put it in the microwave, which if you don't know that that happened there, check it out. So you get microwaves right here also. Cell phones and satellites also use microwaves. So I jump past radio waves pretty quickly. They're the long ones, they're kind of boring. Microwaves are a little more exciting. They're a little bit shorter and thus have less wavelength and a little bit higher amplitude. Um, cell phones and satellites do operate off of microwaves. And I mean, obviously they're used here within your microwave as well to excite the particles of some sort of edible object and thus increase its kinetic energy, which then also increases its thermal energy and warms it up so you can eat it. All right, the next one here. So slightly lower wavelengths, slightly higher frequency. Now we're at infrared waves and you're seeing these wavelengths on here, but um, you would never be expected to memorize these. You'd be given this electromagnetic spectrum um, as something to reference if necessary. All right, thermal energy travels in infrared waves. Um, so we see like a heat, like something that would show heat vision and ID these things, like, like you see the people here being warmer than the area around them, that would be infrared waves that are being picked up. So that's thermal energy. And uh, remote controls, CD-ROM drives also use these. And the reason we see some variation between communications and microwaves, so cell phones and satellites. So these would be the longest communications, medium communications here, and then the shortest communications, things like remote controls. And that's because that energy dissipates as it moves through some space and time and all that stuff. And so they won't work over as long of distances because they have shorter wavelengths and uh, thus work over shorter distances. Now, the ones that work over even shorter distances than that becomes what we are going to focus on the most in this unit, because we're going to look at things that are visible and how we utilize and, um, and manipulate that type of stuff. And so we're going to be looking at a lot of visible light. Now, as we probably all know already, we've got a pretty small spectrum of uh, wavelengths here. You see the wavelengths, and again, they'll have a corresponding frequency with them, but it's a fairly small spectrum of the electromagnetic spectrum overall um, that we actually use and we can utilize with our sensory organs that are our, our eyes. Um, and as we look at these different wavelengths and thus frequencies within that, we see variation in color. And that's really what color comes down to. It's pretty much that simple. What's the frequency? What's the wavelength that corresponds to a specific color? Boom, that's why we see things the way we do. Once we move past this, and now we're shortening wavelength even more, and we are still increasing the frequency, we get into things that can start to become harmful because the frequency is so high and thus they carry more energy with them, even though amplitude really is energy. Uh, another Mr. Berry. Nope. Another Mr. Berry spelling error. Apologies. 
um, but they carry energy with them. And uh, and so we're going to have more energy associated with this higher frequency and shorter wavelength. What in the world? Okay, we're not even going to go there. We're going to move past it. Um, but we see these UV rays here. We have a decreasing um, wavelength and thus an increasing frequency. And we have enough energy at this point to do damage and to do damage specifically to organisms. So this can damage sun um, or it can damage skin, excuse me, it can damage your eyes. Um, it can it can put enough energy out to burn your skin, and this is what a sunburn is: is UV rays and UV waves that are uh, you know bombarding a person here. So we see ultraviolet light and how this can manipulate as well. So this light enables your body to make vitamin D. It can also kill bacteria, um, but it can also do things like again cause some um, some missteps in your DNA genome, and uh, and thus cause it to replicate incorrectly here and cause cancer. So seeing all those things. From there, x-rays, moving in further, these can do significant damage to an organism and um, are the reason why we protect while also utilizing these. So we can see through some objects with x-rays that are very, I mean, it's very useful to be able to utilize this, but can also be very dangerous if we were to continuously bombard with this, you're gonna do damage over time. And then you get to gamma rays and gamma waves here. Um, these are very short, shorter than 10 trillionths of a meter and are produced by radioactive decay. So where there's lots and lots of energy and lots of things vibrating very quickly, that's what makes such a high frequency here. These do damage to pretty much everything. These deteriorate metals. All right, so gamma rays are trouble. No, they will not turn you into the Hulk. They will melt you. So don't ever play with this given the option, and hopefully you're never given the option and have to worry about that. So we pretty much try to stay away from gamma rays and protect ourselves from these. They're very dangerous. Now jumping more into light, again, visible light behaves like the particle in the wave. We saw that. Um, when it hits an object, there are a few different things that it can do. It can reflect, it can be absorbed, or it can be transmitted. And we're going to talk about what happens in each of those coming up. We're going to talk about reflection and re refraction and what it means to see some of it bounce back and some of it be absorbed and so forth and so on. Okay, that's the behavior of light that we're going to look a lot at here for optics. But first, we need to understand that it travels as a wave. Okay, light rays, a beam of light all travels together in some direction. And that's important. We see our frequency again and our wavelength again. The ray model is what I want to focus on here. So this is an assumption made that light rays travel from the object where they are generated to our eyes in straight line paths, okay? For geometric optics, we need to understand this is the part of optics that deals with this ray aspect of light. So we're gonna make the assumption that they do this, despite the fact that I talked about already, well, they actually go up and down a little bit and they don't travel perfectly straight, just like a particle. But in order to understand the behavior of light waves that include billions and trillions of photons at once, we're going to make some general assumptions about the way that they move. And this is the biggest one. We got to assume that they move as rays all together in a direction. And collectively, well, one might start here and one might actually pretty much follow that straight line, but another one might start here and end up over on this side. And since they will all collectively average out, that's all that we really care about, is that they travel like this in this ray model. Now, the first thing they can do is they can reflect. All right, when it strikes a surface, it can potentially bounce off that surface. So all light not reflected is absorbed as thermal energy. And this is why you see different colors, right? This shirt that I'm wearing, it's black. What it's doing, because all light together is seen as white or clear kind of we don't need to get into that debate but it's technically considered to be white and so when it bounces off then we would typically see white so what's actually happening here and the reason that a black shirt in the sun gets hotter is because it absorbs more energy or all of the energy bombarding here so if i had a white shirt versus a black shirt this black shirt's absorbing absorbing more energy and thus i feel that thermal energy because it stays with me whereas a white short shirt would reflect it i don't know why i keep saying short shirt would reflect it and um, thus a person won't be as hot because that energy is leaving them and not staying with them, okay? So first, an angle of incidence. This is the angle that a light ray is reflected. So if I've got a light up above me up here, if the light were to come down here, then it's going to then come in at this angle to my shirt and it's gonna have a angle of reflection that you see there. So we've got angle of incidence and angle of reflection where it's gonna bounce off, okay? 
Now, the law of reflection states that those are always equal to each other. All right? And diffuse reflection here, this is reflection off a rough surface where that's not necessarily the case. And we'll look at an example of that. But what that means is, right, this camera right here, it can see my face easily using geometric optics because it's pointed right at me. But if I move off enough, now that camera that's following a light ray here can't see me. If I move my hand across, it can be seen again because it's within that angle of incidence that allows for visibility within the angle of internal reflection here for the camera. Okay? And so to see that, we've got our angle of incidence. If something's bouncing in here, that's our incident ray. It's got an angle of incidence from the perpendicular line that's against the mirror there. And it will come out at that same angle that is the angle of reflection. Always. In, out. Unless it's coming in in a diffuse or on a, a, a diffracted to some degree surface. Right? So when it's a flat surface like a standard mirror, a plane mirror, as you see there, then it will do that. If it's not, then it will reflect out differently if it's an uneven surface, like a pile of broken glass or something like that. That's why you might have light shine in your eyes one second, but then you move your head and it's not in your eyes anymore. Now, the next motion here, and the next thing that light rays can do is refract, right? So this is when light passes from one medium to another. And you've probably experienced this before. If you've ever been sitting at a restaurant with a glass of water and dropped a straw into it, and it looks like the straw is broken in half. And that's because the light rays that are traveling and showing you, your eyes, that there is a straw there, travel differently as they travel through air versus when they travel through water. And so we see a different medium there. And so we have what's known as refraction. So a refraction is a change in direction or the bending of light that happens because of this. There's an index of refraction that's a denotation for whatever type of surface you've got that it's going to refract this much. And Snell's law um, defines a, a comparison of this in the index of refraction between these materials and the angles at which they act. So we'll see Snell's law right here. N being our index of refraction for one material. And then we've got our angle of incidence for one. So we've got air and water, maybe similar to this. And we see our broken pencil right there, similar to the broken straw. That's what I was referring to before. And so incident rays, we've got an angle of incidence here. And now we're in water down here, substance two, right? And a reflected ray. Now notice this doesn't travel along a perfectly straight line there. It bends downward some. And this is because the angle here for air will result in a different angle for water because they will have a different index of refraction. Now those indexes of refraction are pretty standard for most materials that we would use and focus on here. You see a lot of them listed there, right? In a vacuum, it's 1.0. We consider air to be essentially 1.0, carbon dioxide being approximately that as well. But then when we get into ice and water, those would be in the most common ones. But alcohol or oil or glass, you see that that becomes pretty drastically different right? And to think, oh, well, this is just 1.3 and that was 1.0, but that means it's a 30% different angle, right? That's a, a 0.3 change when you're only talking about a value of one is pretty significant there. So that's your basic refraction. Um, the next one is total internal reflection. Now, what this is, is if we've got a light source here between two medium, right? So two different substances, there is going to be a location right here. And you see that one right here. All right where we have a refraction angle that means we have reflection of rays. And you see in every case here, some reflection coming back down at the same angle as, the, as what it's going out at. But we're going to have a reflection and then a bend along the surface between the two medium here. And that is known as total internal reflection. We'll do uh, a quick lab with that at some point here, but we'll talk more about that later. This is light is in the more dense medium and approaching the less dense medium, that's a requirement, so that's important. This doesn't happen if you're looking from air into water. It only happens if you're looking from water up towards the air. And then the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, and that's what that C is, and that's defined based on the substance as you see there. So this is a pretty specific situation, but it is something I want to make sure that you're aware of. Now, forming images. In order to start talking about mirrors and lenses and how images are formed in different ways, I think the first starting point that we should talk about here is your eye, because that's the only thing that really matters. If your eye isn't working and isn't forming images on itself, 
then you're not going to form any images based on any mirror or any lens because you're not going to have anything that you can see. So, so first, light rays, they enter your eye through the cornea. Um, they are inverted and then projected on your retina in the back of your eye so that your optic nerve can interpret them. Okay? Um, they are inverted. Technically, everything you're looking at on the back of your eye is upside down. Now, your brain knows that and makes it so that it becomes right side up as far as you are um, interpreting images as you see them. But I think that's an important thing to note, right? One and two over here being the top of this tree, they go in, they are inverted, and now it's at the bottom over here. Now, if this image right here wasn't focused right on the back of the eye and it was focused up here, that's why we might get glasses or contacts in front of the eye to change that focal point. So that's what we're going to be talking about is making that focal point work properly. And um, I mean, utilizing some of that equipment that you see if you go to the eye doctor and they put that big thing in front of your face and they spin all the dials and all of a sudden you can see better, right? One or two or two or three or three or four and blah, blah, blah. First, we're going to look at mirrors because mirrors are a little simpler than lenses. OK, so we have concave and convex mirrors, and that will hold true for lenses as well. Concave mirrors over here. Think about those as the entrance to a cave. I think that's the easiest way to do that. Right. So concave mirrors, they reflect the surface on the uh, the inner surface, excuse me, of the sphere is the shiny surface. OK, is the surface that reflects, whereas convex mirrors, it's the outer surface of the sphere that reflects and thus sends light outwards. All right. So this one sinks away from the viewer, so it gets smaller right there. This one bulges out towards the viewer. It spreads that light out. Converging, diverging. Concave mirrors are the ones that we're really going to focus on, all right? So because, that's over here, convex mirrors, not very helpful, all right? They're just going to make images so large that you almost can't interpret them as you look at them. They're going to zoom in really far on little pieces of your face, and it's going to not be very helpful to interpret. So we're actually going to focus mainly for mirrors on concave mirrors, but we will look briefly at convex mirrors as well. All right, so concave mirrors, they reflect it towards that inner focal point. The focal point is also known as the focus. Um, it's where the images that's reflected, where they become um, visible and clearly obvious to the human eye. They're not overly blurry. They are something that you can see and interpret. The center of curvature is twice the distance of the focal point. We're going to look at these on an image in a second here, okay? This is, and the, it's between the focus and this point where all images can be seen. All right, and you're going to see a couple patterns here. We're going to do a lot with this, but real quick. Our focus and our center, center of curvature. Our images are going to be between these points typically, okay? So all the light will come in and bounce off here, and we see that. It's going to be focused at that focal point and then form an image on the other side of that. Now, that will vary. Sometimes it will be inside the focus. Sometimes it will be outside of the center of curvature. We're going to look at examples based on where the place, where the um, location of an object is and how it's focused on and so forth and so on. We're going to do a ton with that later on. Convex mirrors are doing the opposite. They're spreading that light out. So they work similar to that, um, but they focus an image on the other side. Okay. So the focus in the center of curvature for these mirrors, um, this lies on the other side of the mirror. So the focus and the center of curvature on the other side, because that's more likely to be where we'd see those images. And thus, again, it makes it so that the images are hard to interpret, and it's something that we can't use quite as much. Now, when we look at mirrors, there is this mirror equation that's important. This relates the object and the image distance to the focal point of the mirror. So if you know a focal point for a mirror, F, then we could determine how far out an object is based, or the, the mirror image is of the object, or the, excuse me, where the image is, where both are. I don't know why I'm stumbling over this. You can interpret one with the other. The object distance and the image distance based on this relationship if you know where the focal point is for the mirror. All right, we'll do a little bit with that as well. Time for lenses. All right, so moving on to lenses here. Now, these um, are going to have concave, convex, and plane surfaces potentially all wrapped into one. Now, in most cases, they'll be both here where we have a double concave or a double convex. Um, but in some cases, it might be a plano 
Um, so one side being flat, and then rarely also you'll have a concave meniscus or a convex meniscus where both sides are to some degree curved. Um, these ones we're not going to use much in here because that makes for a very, very, very complex situation. Um, you're going to see mostly, like I said, the doubles so that we have a, a pretty straightforward setup. So converging lenses. These take an image and converge it to be smaller and a lower, uh, a more specific focal point. That's all of these images are going to be on the other side. Well, not all of them. There's a chance that you get a. We'll discover this as well. But the focal point typically is going to be on the opposite side of a lens because its job is to have, or at least for a converging lens, is to have the light rays converge at some point. All right. And so we see right here a spot where, okay, we had this image, this focal point not being in the correct spot. It needs to be at the back of the eye because the focal point is where the images can be built, right? And so that's where that will become. And so to clarify something from earlier as well, here for like these concaves and stuff, these are mirrors and will act a bit differently. So based on where this image is located, you could have it at the focus or the focal point or outside or inside of it, all right? We see right here with this lens wanting to make the focal point the back of the eye because we have a lens as opposed to a mirror and its job is to then project whatever would be an image here into that exact location, all right? But we're converging to focus on a certain thing and making an image on the other side that's of some different size. Diverging is gonna do the opposite. It's gonna spread something out. And typically here, this might be, this is a nearsighted versus farsighted situation, right? You need to see closer up things, you need to see further away things. This is gonna be thinner at the center and this makes parallel images diverge. So this is gonna make images grow. That's the purpose here. This is gonna make images magnify. So a magnifying glass is like a converging lens. Diverging lens is gonna make images grow. That's based on the basic shape of these. Now magnification here, we're going to see some very similar things, the distance from the image, the distance from the object, but it's also going to matter the height of the image and the height of the object. All right, so thin lenses are most typically used right there to magnify objects. Positive lens converges, a negative lens diverges. That's not really very important for what we're going to do. We just need to know converging or diverging, but I figured I'd throw in those quick um, notes as well here. Um, from there, we can have combination of lenses. You will not have to solve or draw a ray diagram for anything like this. These are craziness and a lot going on. But um, if we use multiple lenses, in the case of maybe a piece of scientific machinery, we can do things like create very complex, very maximized images for very, very small things. And you all have used these in lab somewhere to some degree, right? So combinations of lenses are very, very possible here also to create some, uh, some more specific images if we're looking to do so. All right, thin films. We have some things that occur in nature that uh, that can create very, very, very small um, reflections and refractions of light that are very unique. And so these things called thin films, they're very, very thin layers of certain materials. Um, soap, uh, gasoline, and oil are two types of these where you would have an incident ray here coming in and because it's very thin, you see the film here being very thin, some reflected on the top, some refracted, reflected, and then refracted again on or from the bottom to the top, then create a spread out image here that are very unique. And you know a spread out image, you've heard of this before, you've maybe even seen a very famous album cover from a long time ago. It's a Pink Floyd album called Dark Side of the Moon, and it does things like make rainbows. Okay, it spreads out light then so that you can see all the different parts to it, right? So thin films um, are going to have that reflection and refraction combination of light that allow for like an oil spot or a bubble of soap to look like a rainbow in color um, because they are, are manipulating light in that way. All right, so thin films um, act very similarly to lenses, but are much, much thinner and aren't utilized as, as naturally the same way. But it's interesting so that, uh, if nothing else, similar properties causing these two natural phenomenon to happen. Now, when we create images with lenses or mirrors or anything else, there are two types of images we're going to look at, and they are real and virtual images. A real image is an image created where the light actually converges somewhere, okay? A virtual image is an image created where light appears to converge. So let's say here we have a mirror, right? A person 
sees an object when they look at the mirror as if it was right over here. But the object is actually over here. The incident rays are coming from the object, hitting and reflecting off the mirror and going to the eye to be seen. So would this be a real or virtual image? You're right, it's a virtual image. Okay, and that's because they see this object as being, this person would see this object as being far ahead here, and the object is actually over there. A good way to think about this is when you look in the mirror, are you actually looking at yourself? Or are you looking at a virtual, a created image of yourself? And it's a virtual image, right? It's got to be because you can't pull your eyeballs out and look at yourself. Um, so here below also, now we've got binoculars. And so we've got an image here. This is real because the light actually converges from this tree in these person's eyes. All right. So real images are converging rays. They're in front of mirrors. They're behind lenses. All right, virtual images are diverging rays. They're behind mirrors or in front of lenses. And that's what this one was. This was behind the mirror. And so thus a virtual image. Okay. Now the left right reversal is interesting as well. Real quick, don't think about it. Just answer which hand am I holding up? If you're just looking at me based on what you're seeing right now, this probably looks like this can look like my right or my left hand, right? As I'm holding this up, it's my right hand. Do that next time you're in front of a mirror. Because if you hold up your right hand, it's the hand on this side. In order to do that, the reflection you're going to see then would be holding up the other hand. This is my left hand now. Notice the wash first, not the wash. Okay? So if you hold up your right hand while looking in the mirror, you have an image reversal and it's flipped. All right? I think about my hair going this way because that's the way I always look at it in the mirror. Right? To everybody else, my hair's going the other direction. You don't look like what you're used to seeing yourself like because of this. And I think that's really, really interesting. So you can raise that right hand in the mirror there. And this is because those light rays are flipped as they reflect. And so just consider for a sec, if you've got a part in your hair, if you have um, a mole or a single earring or anything that's slightly asymmetrical, the way that you visualize yourself having that is not the same as the rest of the world. Just an interesting thought. Object versus image distance. So reminder here, we've got our mirror equation below. For a plain mirror, if you stand two meters away from the mirror, then you must focus your eyes on a spot two meters behind the mirror in order to clearly see the image. That's important to note there, right? So this varies with curved mirrors and lenses, but this helps you find that focal point. It, it should overall be an expectation that for a flat plain mirror, the size is going to vary based on how close or how far away from the mirror it is. But as we curve, those things change a little bit, right? Now, orientation of images. Images between the mirror and lens and the focal point will be upright. So anything, so these lights right here, right? This light ray right here, that's the head of the, uh, oh my gosh, giraffe. Wow. Sorry. Um, uh, the head of the giraffe is moving in here and it's moving down towards the focal point there. If you were to somehow see it here, then the image would still have the head there and still have the feet down here, the feet following in from there. Once it hits the focal point, that's when it's inverted. And so then this ray that comes from the feet goes through, passes the focal point, and it's now up on top. So now we have an inverted image once we're past the focal point. Before the focal point, this would be upright. Past the focal point, it is inverted. All right, that's important to note as well. From there, also relative size of the image or object. Um, three types of image sizes are there in, in comparison, and that's important to note. And this is pretty basic, right? It's basically a how big of a zoom are you doing, um, right? A true image size shows the image as exactly what it is. All right, maybe it's just reflecting it off a surface. Um, I don't know why you'd really use a lens for that, right? We don't really use a lens to do a true image size. But um, if you've got a plain mirror, you could have a true image size because the image is just the same size as what you see originally. An enlarged image um, is an image that gets bigger as we were to, as we use potentially like a magnifying glass here, right? To make these words bigger. A reduced image is something where we want to make something smaller based on whatever other need we might have to do that. All right, so a couple more things about waves and how they're going to work together overall, and then we'll wrap this up. Sorry, these are running a little long. So first, wave interference. Um, waves with similar shapes add or subtract from each other based on the amplitude that they have, um, 
and, and can do similar things when they're diffracting from each other and overlapping as well. So a good way to think about this, right here, we have destructive interference. This wave, if you'll note, starts by going up and then goes down. This one goes down and then goes up. If I put those together, then I have a flat line overall. Whereas here, it starts up and goes down, up and down. And so it's a bigger wave with a greater amplitude here. This one right here, destructive wave, that's your noise canceling headphones. That's shocks on your car. That's something that produces this wave here to be destructive for whatever other wave is present and cut that wave out to make it so we don't feel it, we don't hear it, we don't see it. Constructive waves here, this is us turning the volume up on a sound wave, all right? We've got this wave right here. We're going to add another one to it to make it an even louder wave. And so we've got more to it then as far as the, uh, the actual amplitude and thus the volume in the sense then of a sound wave, all right? Now, we've got some overlapping stuff here. Again, we're going to see more of these and this diffraction patterns and stuff like that as we get into our next unit. So I'm going to save a little bit of that. And we'll deal with that a little bit more later. I'm a little bit more for interference there, right? Combination of the two waves. We see them coming together there. Constructive interference, making bigger amplitude. Destructive interference, getting rid of that completely. They combine to make the larger wave here. They combine to make a smaller wave or no wave over here. I referenced this earlier, but we also have this thing called dispersion. So we're dispersing a wave. This is the spreading of white light, and it's done through a prism. And it's done because of the shape of a prism and the manipulation of the light. We're spreading it out. So what was packed um, early on, I'm going to find that spot real quick. Apologies. Way back up in the spectrum right here. Um, all of this right here, this will be just one little spread of wavelength or of, of different wavelengths and different um, frequencies for visible light. Once that goes into a prism, it is then spread out to look like a much bigger here rainbow. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about dispersion. It is dispersing the light and spreading it out. And that's how we end up with this right here. All right. Rainbows, are it's a natural dispersion of light through water molecules as they are suspended in the air. And we need a fairly significant amount of water suspended in the air in order for that to happen. And that's why you only see it typically after uh, a rain shower. So there you go. Diffraction, and that goes a little bit back up towards this. This is diffracting waves that are overlapping. So we kind of looked at the interference of those as they overlap each other first from two different sources. I'm going to explain a little bit more about what this is. So this is a phenomenon when waves encounter an obstacle um, that has, like, let's say a flat plane here, but there's a little hole in the middle. So a wave comes up here and hits this, and it's going to spread out, and it's going to bend and travel outwards from it. So I'm going to jump to this real quick and I'll come back. So the wave travels in, it hits this one slit right there and spreads out and becomes curved as it travels outwards from there. Okay, so that would be a single slit diffraction. This bends the waves as they move through that, uh, that individual opening and causes them to move in a different pattern, a different shape. Multiple slit diffractions is the same thing, but now we have what's known as a diffraction grating. So numerous different diffracting locations that will bend the waves in a bunch of different way or different multiplications of that same cycle there. So again, a multiple diffraction grating here, we have two. And so now we see more happening there. And now we have what, what five right there. So we see uh, an even greater dispersion in a different um, overlap of this situation, okay? The diffraction grating is the large number of evenly spaced parallel slits. So the diffraction grating from one here to two there to five there is going up as we keep going. And you see it produces overall then, um, right here, mostly focused in the middle. Most are going right through this spot, but some of those are going out a little bit in different spots because of the dual nature of light that will be looked at in the next unit. And we'll talk about why this happens in the next unit a little bit more, but we need to see this and understand a little bit what's happening for diffraction because there's some very specific ways that light travels based on it as it goes through it. So a large number of equally spaced parallel slits. If we do this enough and create enough of those, we have something known as polarization. And so what you've got with a polarized lens, um, very common in sunglasses, is wave interference that allows for a block here. So we see these blocks in place. It allows for some light to travel through and some of the light that we want that's visible here that we see with, but it blocks some other light based on the gradient that's in place and makes it so that it doesn't travel through. And so it's typically 
reflected light that we're looking to block out. So light that's bouncing off of um, a windshield of a car or um, the surface of a lake or the ocean or a pool or something like that. That's what it's blocking out here to make it so it doesn't get to your eye, right? So we see some light traveling through the lens, some light not traveling through the lens. That happens because of these diffraction gratings that are known commonly as polarization. That's where we're going to end these notes and uh, get into the rest of this unit coming up. So almost done. Y'all are doing awesome. We will get through the end of this class and I will see you there.